So welcome everyone. Thanks to all of you who are joining. We're just waiting for a few more of our registrants to uh, join the Zoom. We can see that people are coming, uh, but we're about to get started. You're in the right place if you're looking for the event called <laughs> Civil Society Solidarity, Building Bridges Across Global Health Advocacy in Crisis Times. Well, I'm delighted to see that there are 45 um, people already on the line. We'll, uh, I, let's get started so we don't lose any time for the exciting discussion that we've got uh, prepared for today uh, and others can join in as we go along. I do believe the event's being recorded. So if you've missed the first couple of minutes, you'll be able to catch it on the GHC website. Um, welcome to today's event. Again, um, Civil Society Solidarity, Building Bridges Across Global Health Advocacy in Crisis Times, organized by the Global Health Council. My name is Amy baldasser Bush, and I'm really delighted to be your moderator today. Uh, I am a Senior Director for Health Policy Advocacy and Engagement, and also the Senior Director for Women, Children, and Adolescents Health at Management Sciences for Health, a longtime member of the Global Health Council, um, which is dedicated to building stronger health systems for greater health impact. I'm also pleased to be here. I think as so many of us today, I'm wearing multiple hats. So I'm also pleased to be here um, as a representative of the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030. Uh, as you may know, the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism is a, the CSO constituency working uh, with the global movement to increase commitment to universal health coverage. Um, and finally, I'm also very honored to be a board member uh, at the Global Health Council, which is bringing you this event today. Uh, I'm sure you know if you've joined in, um, but GHC is the um, leading membership organization supporting and connecting advocates, implementers, and stakeholders who are working across global health priorities worldwide. Um, and GHC, in addition to working as a convener in US and global health spaces, has been a leader in making the case for the crucial role of civil society engagement in the response to COVID-19 at the, the sort of multilateral fora level uh, and increasingly at regional and national levels as well. And that's what um, brings us to the conversation today. Uh, as you may or may not know, the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism of UHC 2030, along with the uh, Social Participation Technical Network, which is hosted by the World Health Organization, conducted a global survey uh, and some research on uh, COVID task forces in 24 countries around April, May, when we were really in the, the midst of the first wave um, of COVID here. This research has been published in the journal BMJ, by the way, if you wanna take a look at it. And perhaps not surprisingly to those of us on the call, what we found is that there was very little uh, formal civil society engagement in national government COVID decision-making efforts. And particularly notable also uh, was that although, of course, there are virologists and epidemiologists and, and uh, politicians doing the COVID decision making, um, the majority of uh, civil society respondents that we talked to or the majority of um, COVID task forces that we reviewed did not include uh, almost any uh, formal civil society engagement, and also experts on non-COVID-19 health, social, and societal consequences uh, were not included in those bodies. And there's also very low female representation um, in those bodies. I think we've also seen quite a bit, uh, quite a few challenges for, for civil society engagement in regional and global processes related to addressing COVID. So much so that uh, Global Health Council, the CSEM and others actually convened a civil society town hall with WHO Director General Tedros to call this out and to ask for his leadership uh, in changing and ensuring the engagement of civil society in COVID response efforts. So I think that that little bit of background, hopefully for you, sets the stage on the importance of rallying advocates across global health issues to coordinate our collective demands on COVID, to leave no one behind, to ensure um, equity and respect for human rights in the COVID response. And I think it also highlights for us the importance of the power of not just working in advocacy silos, but of leveraging messages from across uh, global health 
uh, social determinants of health, economic, environmental work um, to sort of reinforce each other's call and bring continued attention to the importance of civil society and community engagement in the COVID response. So to talk more about that, we've brought together a very amazing panel of advocates for you today who are really working daily at the intersections um, of civil society advocacy during COVID. I'll briefly introduce them now, although you can hear more from them when they make their remarks. Um, we're pleased to be joined by uh, Donna DaCosta Martinez. Uh, Donna is the executive director of the Family Planning Association of Trinidad and Tobago. And she's also speaking on the panel today as a representative of the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030. Welcome, Donna. We're pleased to have with us uh, Jenny Miller, who is the Executive Director of the Global Health and Climate Alliance, uh, the leading global convener of health professional and health civil society organizations to address climate change. Welcome, Jenny. And we're pleased to be joined by Yolanda Moyo, who is the Senior Director for Policy and Advocacy at IAVI, where she leads the uh, strategic design and implementation of advocacy activities across uh, the IAVI portfolio. She's also representing today the South Africa Health Technologies Advocacy Coalition. I think we'll hear about the importance of coalitions in our conversation. Um, today, and that coalition advocates for an en enabling environment for research, development, and access to life-saving innovations. So before we kick off the discussion with the panel, uh, just two quick technical announcements. Uh, please, during the course of the presentations, all uh, participant lines will be muted, but we do welcome you to begin submitting questions at any time for the panelists in the Q&A function. Uh, any other you know, questions and comments you have, or if you're having technical issues, our colleagues from the Global Health Council are available to help respond to those. Um, if you'd like to see all the screens at once, if you're not familiar with Zoom, you can switch to gallery view in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll be shining the spotlight on the speaker so you can follow along in this virtual panel. Uh, also wanted to let you know lots of social media live tweeting is going on, uh, led by GHC and partners. Encourage you to participate if you can multitask while listening to the, the panelists. Uh, so without any further delay, um, let's get started with the, the conversation. Um, I'm going to start with a broad question uh, for each of our panelists, um, and we'll ask Yolanda um, to go first. Um, so Yolanda, what lessons have you learned regarding civil society engagement during the COVID-19 pandemic? That's a pretty broad question. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing your lessons. Go ahead. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's really um, apparent that uh, COVID-19 um, has presented us with many challenges. Um, and as advocates, it's really affected uh, what we do as, as the core of uh, our engagement and uh, bringing people together face to face, uh, having engagements, having meetings, um, that human connection that we took so, so for granted uh, is no longer there. And we've learned a, a number of lessons and, and I'd just like to maybe just highlight a few. Uh, one of them is really that we are stronger together, bringing together all the advocates from across um, health areas and having a common voice, um, amplifying our voices and also bringing in um, our networks and leveraging our reach uh, during these difficult times has been very, very important. Uh, and also bringing in resources because we all know that resources are scarce. And as if we pull together, we, we, we are stronger together and we can maximize uh, the resources that we have. And secondly, I think we have learned how um, we need to be organized because uh, quite often we are left out because um, no one can find us. They don't know who we are, who we represent, and um, you know what value we add. So I think as advocates, we've learned that it's really important to articulate who we are, um, what we represent, and um, where where they can find us. You know, when when we are actually uh, being asked to uh, re represent uh, civil society at, uh, at at regional, national, and regional platforms. Um, and then perhaps thirdly, um, that COVID-19 uh, has shown us how the world has grown so much in, in terms of um, interconnectedness, 
how we are now closer to one another than you know we were ever before you know so we we are identifying with each other's issues across the globe um we we, we are all impacted in 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 many different ways but we've we're seeing the similarities across um the the, the globe of how uh, it's important for us to make sure that civil society is engaged because really um, we are key to impacting the, the, the pandemic in terms of um, managing information uh, that is reaching people, uh, grassroots people, uh, making sure we are sending out accurate, correct messaging, um, and also um, making sure that we're mobilizing communities and encouraging everyone to do the right thing, to wash their hands, to you know, sanitize, wear masks and social distance. I think that has really been a, a valuable lesson to, to, to say that it's great that uh, policies are being made and that uh, you know, vaccines and other uh, biomedical uh, prevention technologies are being um, developed, but we also need to make sure that we are being responsible at a community level and civil society really uh, brings that um, value add. Um, so, so I'd say those uh, in a nutshell are the, the, the highlights or the lessons that we've learned. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, Jenny, same, same question for you about the lessons you're seeing in the context of COVID. Yeah, um, you know, COVID, of course, has been um, hugely daunting in so, so many ways. And I think the two biggest challenges for the work that the Global Climate and Health Alliance uh, does um, that we encountered right away, um, one was the some of the core meetings and places that we engage um, and bring the kind of health community voice to the table around climate change are um, events like the World Health Assembly um, and the UNFCCC um, uh, climate negotiations each year. And with both of those meetings either canceled or virtual, virtual in the case of the World Health Assembly and then, and then postponed in the case of COP, um, we lost that opportunity to be there in person, talking with delegations, collaborating across the health community to, to organize interventions and statements and that sort of thing, um, engaging in those venues with uh, media, et cetera. Um, so two of our key kind of uh, intervention points were lost. But the other really significant challenge is that um, GCHA's core constituency is, of course, the health community bringing their voice to the climate issue. So um, uh, medical groups, uh, public health groups, etc. And our core constituency was immediately um, extremely busy directly responding to the pandemic. Uh, and the idea of um, asking them and calling upon them to also continue to address this other urgent um, uh, health crisis, which is climate change, uh, you know, was was delicate, and and um, they they would just simply weren't as available. Um, I think the opportunity that uh, opportunities that have arisen is um, with the shift to uh, more online interaction. There's been actually, in some ways. Um, more collaboration in this, uh, you know, within the civil society groups that I work with, you know, because we've, you know, we've just realized we've got to do all of this online. But I would also say that, um, you know, as we saw governments begin to respond to the economic impacts of COVID um, and develop these kind of recovery packages, stimulus packages, massive investments that would kind of tap national budgets for years to come. Um, and they were responding to the, the huge economic toll that this, this virus has taken. But many of those packages were not actually putting us on a path to a healthier future. In fact, they were taking us backwards on some of the core issues that we work on, which is sustainability, um, uh, ecosystem uh, stability, um, and, and climate change. Um, and the health organizations and health professionals that I regularly work with were quite frankly alarmed by this. You know, they're kind of 
in the clinic and uh, on the front lines with the pandemic. And meanwhile, on the side, their governments are taking decisions that mean that after this health crisis, we'll then be facing the health crises that climate change will bring. So that became really a rallying point for the health community um, in response to the COVID crisis. Wow. Uh we're going to talk more about that because those are some extremely important points thinking about the short term versus the long term. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Donna, I know we've been having some challenges with your camera this morning, so it's okay if we aren't able to see you, but I do want to invite you to share um, your experiences, your lessons learned regarding civil society engagement in the context of COVID uh, where you're working in the Caribbean and Latin America. Go ahead. Donna, I know we lost your video, but it looks like you're still there. Can we get you on audio? Can you hear me? Okay, let's maybe move on to- Is that okay? The... Oh, there you are. Go ahead, Donna. Okay, great. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening. We've been having problems in country. Um, uh, but let me start by saying thank you, Amy. And also to say that um, I want to congratulate the Global Health Council and the civil society engagement mechanism CS CSEM for UHC 2030 for organizing this very critical um, um, webinar, um, particularly on Human Rights Day. Um, I think one of the things is that civil society organizations, um, we recognize is that we have an essential role to play in holding government to account and giving a voice to the most marginalized. However, I think the COVID-19 pandemic um, demonstrates the stark reality of the lack of engagement and participation of civil society organizations in the response. Um, I think I would like to highlight because already Jenny and Yolanda have highlighted some of the challenges, but I think one of the major challenges that this public health crisis exposes is the widening inequality around the world, and more so in my own region, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, and threatens to exacerbate the gap between rich and poor, pushing us back decades in our progress towards a more equal world. Um, I think that the crisis is also having a considerable impact on women and girls and their access to healthcare, particularly to sexual and reproductive health services. And I think, and I really want to stress this aspect of it because I think um, because of the major emphasis on the COVID response, it means that um, um, civil society organizations like those of the family planning associations in the Caribbean and in Latin America, they really have to, have to rise to the occasion to ensure that they can fill the gaps. Um, I think also that a challenge has been that the public health protocols, including lockdown measures enforced in countries have led to a sharp increase in gender-based violence. And we wake up each morning to, the, to you know, hearing the number of women um, who have been suffering from gender-based violence, women who are murdered, and you know, this has been going on and, and increasingly so. In addition to which, I think women make up a dis disproportionate percentage of workers in the informal sector in low and middle income countries and are bearing the brunt of the economic fallout. Because I think currently more women are being pushed into extreme poverty than men. Um, because, you know we, know, we know the story about, you know, women, um, you know, being lower paid in their jobs and men and, 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 and all that goes with that discussion. Um, but I think in what is happening is that we are seeing that the women are the ones that are most impacted. The pandemic is also showing increased incidence, particularly among vulnerable populations like indigenous people, the elderly, prisoners, migrants, and members of the LGBTI community. One of the other major challenge is the lack of data. Um, and, it, and this is a, a significant weakness of regional and national COVID-19 responses, because if we don't have the data, then we're really pitching in the dark. 
civil society will also face, we know, dwindling resources. And, we, and this has already started happening because most of the funding has had to go towards the, um, has had to go towards the um, treating with the response. So as the country, you know, so that those contributions that allowed us to do work on behalf of the public interest as that dries up, um, that will continue to dry up because of the widespread economic um, crisis. But I think there are opportunities. Um, while this may be one of the most difficult environments for civil society, it is also a critical moment where our work has never been more important. The ability to mitigate these challenges that I outlined relies heavily on civil society to maintain its role and give voice to communities most likely to be left behind in the public emergency response. So there's an immediate role for civil society in monitoring the impact of the pandemic on vulnerable communities and to advocate for effective responses. One of the things is that civil society can facilitate engagement with affected communities a critical part of ensuring context, contextually relevant responses. So it is really vital that civil society be supported to advocate for measures to protect and prioritize the most vulnerable, including using their own influence to inform government priorities in the emergency and recovery phases of the pandemic response. You have things like budget monitoring, grassroots social mobilization that only civil society know best how to, how to do that. And tracking the quality and reach of the service delivery will all be important elements of the civic engagement. Some of the actions we can take moving forward is that by, we can do so by ensuring inclusive and cross-sectoral representation and the meaningful participation of civil society in the COVID-19 global regional, national um, task forces and decision-making processes to ensure that the voices of marginalized and the vulnerable groups with specific needs are incorporated. You know, the time is, is more important now that we, that, we, that we engage, that we come together, as Yolanda said in the beginning, and, 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 and begin to engage with other, one another so that we become a force to be reckoned with as it relates to our role and function within the COVID-19 pandemic. I think also that continuous provision of essential health services that provide the full spectrum of care, including mental health, sexual and reproductive health, life-saving treatment for major infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and gender-based violence response services and the provision of innovative health commodities tested for safety and efficacy in the whole range of vulnerable population groups. But not only innovative health commodities, but innovative modalities for, for delivering um, services to those people who are most vulnerable. And as a, a particularly in the Caribbean and Latin America, we have had to really think outside the box. And for some of us who had never been introduced to telehealth services, you find that a lot of this has been happening in order that we could reach those clients and those persons who are most in need because of the fact that they weren't able to access those services in the public spaces. And one more, is that I think building partnerships among civil society organizations across borders, regions, as well as regions, will amplify their voice and the important role that we as CSOs can and must play in the COVID-19 response. And Amy, I'd stop there. Thank you, Donna. And that's a great, the closing of your comments is a great lead in to the next part of the conversation, that importance of working across borders, across regions and across movements within civil society. I want to turn back to Yolanda now um, to ask Yolanda, given specifically your work across advocacy spaces in Africa, particularly in the research and development space, what have you seen as the challenges and opportunities for civil society engagement in light of COVID-19 in those national or regional forums that Donna was mentioning? 
Thank you, Amy. I, I think uh, one of the um, opportunities is that really we have very strong civil society uh, organizations in, in country. So each country has a network of civil society organizations that are well established. The challenge that we have is finding um, civil society organizations that work at regional level across uh, borders, as uh, Donna has mentioned. So the, the, the strategy that we've used as SATAC is to work with sister coalitions, um, uh, you know, that, that do similar work in different countries and try and create a, a regional network of uh, civil society organizations that really are championing the same issues. So, um, you know, that's how we, we have maximized our voices within the region. And uh, what we've seen, I think, uh, is a double-edged sword in terms of opportunities for engagement, where uh, being online um, and having virtual meetings has given us uh, access that we haven't seen before, um, where, you know, previously closed meetings that would only be accessible to a few are now open for um, a lot more people to attend. Um, because of re uh, less restrictions on the numbers and also um, uh, reduced costs for traveling uh, to, to, to attend these meetings. So that has been an opportunity. Um, and what we try and do is to share information. So even though these spaces, spaces are open, information about you know, how to participate has been lacking and it hasn't been reaching uh, all of uh, the civil society organizations or, or networks that we would like to uh, make sure are sitting uh, within these uh, platforms to bring civil society voices to the table. Uh, we're also seeing that, um, you know, having meetings online has been a challenge because we are leaving others behind. Uh, so those who don't have access to infrastructure for, um, you know, internet and, you know, devices for connecting to the internet. And also uh, in Africa, uh, data packages for internet connectivity are very expensive. Uh, so we've had to readjust how we work and, you um, make sure that there are budgets for um, uh, enabling those who don't have access to data to buy data to participate. Um, and that also res restricts the, the length of time that we can engage on, an, on a digital platform. Um, because, you know, uh, previously we would have maybe a day long event or a two day event, uh, but we can't do that online because, you know, we can't have people sitting for, for for longer than an hour really, you know, to stay engaged. So it's it's been it's been a, a mixed bag of of, of opportunity, but also uh, challenges uh, in terms of how we 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 are engaging. And obviously, you know, for, in Africa we we have uh, power issues where, you know, connectivity is based on uh, power availability, and sometimes we have issues with electricity. Um, so when you're organizing an online event, you have to always have a backup plan in case you lose one of your speakers because of the power cut. <laughs> so I'm hoping I stay connected to you today. <laughs> Just like Donna, it happens here in New York City too, I have to say. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's it for me. Thanks, Yolanda. Great. Um, building on, uh, and those are, I think all of us are, even if you can't see all the participants online, virtually nodding our heads in agreement with those experiences, both the opportunities and the challenges of the um, of the remote working. I wanted to turn to Jenny and pick up a little bit on the interesting intersections um, of health and climate change advocacy you were mentioning before. And I wanted to mention that I enjoyed reading uh, uh, the piece that you're a co-author on in the recently launched Journal of Climate and Health. I encourage folks to, to check it out, calling on health professionals and health organizations to advocate to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. So congratulations on that piece of work. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about those linkages between climate and global health civil society, particularly during COVID. You know, how are those two movements working together? Or what are the opportunities to, uh, to increase that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I think one of the things that this pandemic has unquestionably done is put health front and center for everyone. Um, and the, the implications of this within the climate movement, um, you know, for a long, long time, health was sort of on the periphery 
of the climate movement, even though health is written into the Paris Agreement, the right to health is um, written in as sort of a fundamental rationale for action on climate change. Um, the reality is within the climate space, there has not been that much genuine engagement of health and recognition of health. Um, and health is really critical to thinking about climate change both because we need to be adapting and, and building resilience to the climate impacts that will and are already impacting health, and because the, um, the opportunities for health from the ways we address climate change are really, really powerful. Um, if we did everything we needed to do to address, uh, to, to meet the target, uh, the most ambitious target of the Paris Agreement, um, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, that um, the cost of that action would be more than paid for globally by health benefits due to reduced air pollution. So there are powerful reasons for connecting these two, and yet it wasn't happening that much in the, in the climate space and the many sectors, energy, transportation, um, necessary for that. The pandemic has put health front and center and it has made people aware that if you have a health crisis, it's not just going to affect people's health. It will shut down the economy. It will affect supply chains. It will affect health equity or equity issues beyond health. Um, so one of the results of that is that climate is now becoming more central to that, or sorry, health is becoming more central to that climate conversation. And I think that's a really, really important and valuable development that we have to build on. I think where there's still a, a tremendous amount of opportunity, um, work to be done and a responsibility, and I take it personally as a responsibility to reach out around this, is that those of us working on climate and health um, are not uh, fully linking up with folks working on HIV, folks working on universal health care, folks working on family planning and access to sexual and reproductive health services. Um, there is a bit more connection with the non-communicable disease community, but we need to be working together, reinforcing one another's messages, um, and really calling for an integrated, not only integrated response to the pandemic, but integrated um, strategies as we figure out the future that we want for humanity, one that will really be sustainable, equitable, and really protect people's health. Um, so yeah, a lot of work to be done there. Well, and I think platforms like this are a great one for making those connections across, you know, we've got almost 60 other advocates and, and partners Absolutely. on the call who may be hearing about this opportunity to connect with our uh, fellow advocates in the climate space. So um, an important opportunity to raise awareness of that. Um, Donna, I want to turn back to you before we move on to um, our discussion, in addition to the celebration of Human Rights Day, uh, we're also preparing this week on Saturday to celebrate International Universal Health Coverage Day. And we just had uh, International AIDS Day, so lots of important focus on, uh, on health and on human rights and the intersection here. Um, in the month of December. And the theme uh, for this year's Universal Health Coverage Day is Protect Everyone. Uh, and it's about uh, reminding us that there's not really a choice between health security, you know, response to pandemics and, and, and preparation and building resilience and universal health coverage. We need both. Uh, we need strong, equitable systems, you know, grounded in primary uh, health care and human rights. Uh, both to achieve universal health coverage and to ensure uh, protection and, and response and resilience in the face of future pandemics. It's been very interesting to hear from you in your previous comments about the specific experience in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I'm wondering in your advocacy work whether you've identified new opportunities now in the region um, for advocacy around universal health coverage in light of COVID. You did raise up some of those uh, inequity issues before. So would love to hear about how that's been, been evolving for you and your advocacy. So thank you again, Jenny. And I'm very glad that um, the UHC Day is, has as a theme, protect everyone. And I think we should leave that, um, we should add to that, leave, leave no one behind. Because let's face it, 
the, the universal health coverage principle of leaving no one behind or protect everyone as is going to be the theme um, has been compromised. We see how many poor and vulnerable people across our region are facing hardships. We cannot even begin to talk about UHC if we do not focus on availability, the accessibility, affordability, and acceptability of quality healthcare services, including sexual and reproductive healthcare without discrimination. So COVID-19 crisis has made the gaps in the health system become even more obvious. However, it presents a, an opportunity for civil society organizations, particularly in my region, to bind together in the region, to advocate for our governments, to address in a serious manner, the need for universal health coverage. And I think I, it was mentioned very earlier on in, in, in the introductory remarks that working, what we really have to do is to work together for impact. We have a unique opportunity um, in the, um, the IPPF Americas and the Caribbean to really work together um, to ensure um, that we are able to carry, you know, to carry forward our energies and raise our voices in terms of getting our governments to understand we're not prepared to sit back and allow you know, and not be recognized for the work that we can do so well. And we're here to help. So that I think it would be remiss of me if I did not use this opportunity to raise my own voice, to echo the calls to action by the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030, which as you know, is the Civil Society constituency of UHC 2030, the global movement to strengthen health systems for universal health coverage to ensure that UHC policies are inclusive and equitable. As a priority, we see that governments must adopt a whole of society approach and meaningfully engage civil society and communities in UHC implementation to ensure accountability. When we get our vaccine for, for, um, for COVID-19, we're still gonna have these major health problems facing us. So it is better that we work together so that as we move along the, 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 the whole COVID-19 um, landscape, we're able to be addressing all the health needs in like manner. Civil society, must be included in national and regional short and long-term COVID-19 decision-making processes and task forces to ensure that the voices of vulnerable groups with specific needs and or at additional risk are included. Uh, civil society represents communities and therefore understands and can best advocate for the recognition that different groups have different needs and constraints which require adapted solutions. And when you listen to the, 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 our, my colleagues from the Caribbean speak about their programs in their individual countries, what they are doing to become involved, what they are doing to ensure that no one is left behind, you realize what impact that could have when we bring all of it together. Um, uh, and, and I think that is important that we can share resources across boundaries, across regions, and to be more impactful in the work that we do. Additionally, governments really should be collaborating with civil society to design and implement accountability mechanisms that enable transparent and open communication and respect the right for information principle. These accountability mechanisms should monitor the progress of the COVID-19 strategies using disaggregated data for differences by gender, by age, by income, race, ethnicity, 
um, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and geographic location. If we do not have data, how else can we measure the impact of what we are doing, what the government is doing, and to see really and truly if it's making a difference in the development of our societies. Our governments must urgently address the legal and policy barriers, including the overuse of criminal laws in the name of protecting public health, as well as harmful social, traditional and cultural norms that prevent women and girls, marginalized and criminalized groups from receiving essential health services. So there's a fantastic opportunity for, for civil society organizations in the midst of this crisis to come together to be more, to have a bigger voice, to have a bigger impact, to be able to get bigger resources together so that we can help in terms, help our governments to treat with some of the other issues that perhaps, hopefully not, have fallen off considerably from their, their current agenda because the focus is so much on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd stop here, Jenny, um, um, Amy. Thanks, Donna. So there's your rallying call for UHC Day. I feel like Donna is one of our global uh, global <laughs> champions for work on UHC. Um, and it was good timing because it leaves us with about 15 minutes um, for, for q and I'm going to um, open with one question that we've got already from the participants. I also have a question from one of my panelists to our other panelists. Um, so let me start by sharing a question um, from Zachary Wong, who asks about uh, what do you think are the role of community facilitators in this time of crisis to increase public representation? Do you have any tips or advice for community facilitators working during this difficult time? Uh, so that's one question. And then Jenny, would you like to pose your question? Maybe we'll do two at a time and then you guys can decide who wants to respond to which one. Um, so we've got Zachary's question. Thanks for that, Zachary. And Jenny, over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Amy. Um, uh, a question for, for Donna or Yolanda or both. Um, it, what if there's one key message or issue that you would value having the health groups working on climate change to start to incorporate into our messaging, our calls to action, our advocacy, our demands? Like, is there one sort of key issue or message that you'd like to see us start integrating as a starting point for a, a more unified approach to our, our several issues and, and these, these challenges? So maybe I'd take that first. Sure. Um, Jenny, I think one of the, the, the fundamental issues that we have to overcome is the fact that there are still a number of organizations, civil society organizations, that are unable to make the connection between climate and health, and more specifically, I don't know if you agree with me, but more specifically, sexual and reproductive health. And I think that, that, that we have to start from a common understanding of how we can bridge the gap with all the health issues in relation to climate and how together we can be better advocates for each other's, for each other's mandate. So I don't know how, how Yolanda, what Yolanda thinks, but I feel that what we have a lot of education to do with our, with, our, um, with our civil society organizations to understand the connectivity between and amongst the issues so that we can have a better advantage in terms of how we pitch our strategies, our advocacy strategies that will be beneficial to all. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Donna. I, I think for me, just to echo that, that we, we, we need more information in terms of where the intersections are and identifying, you know, how we can work together to really amplify, um, you know, issues that are, are common across uh, the different areas. And also having platforms where we can engage because quite often we are we are advocating in silos, you know, because you know we perhaps because of that lack of information in terms of where the intersections are, 
it's difficult to carve um, common ground where we can um, uh, come together and really uh, amplify our messaging across issues. Thanks, ladies. Um, and then I wonder on, and I think um, since Jenny's open to specific uh, messages, we also welcome input from others who are, are in the audience. If you've got key asks for, um, for our friends at the uh, Global Health and, uh, and Climate Change Alliance, uh, feel free to share them. Um, on Zachary's question about the role of community facilitators, or I guess those who may be doing um, outreach at the community yeah. level working during this difficult time, anyone want to share? Donna, you want to come in on that one? Okay, so um, thanks Zachary for that, that, that question. Um, we have in Trinidad and Tobago a similar, um, the community facilitators are the foot soldiers, but we have, a, we call them community-based health volunteers. And they are really an important, um, an important um, group as it relates to civil society organizations because they are the ones on the ground. They are the ones working the communities and seeing firsthand what the issues are. And therefore, I, 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 how I see it is as an integrated part of the, of the, of the CSO movement um, working together in order that we can really get the big picture, understand what the issues are, when understand the issues not in, only in terms of, of the people and the, uh, uh, those persons or clients who need to have access to, for services, but even understand the, the situations that the community facilitators face so that we can have a more um, structured, approach to the work that we do at the community level. So that um, for us, we rely in Trinidad and Tobago, we rely in our outreach program very heavily on our community-based volunteers slash community facilitators. I like that, what's more simple, um, to be the go-between between the community and the work that the, the civil society organization is doing. So um, for me, um, I think we have to do more of that and more, you know, and involving and bringing the, the facilitators more into the ambit of the civil society group and also being the voice at the table, having had that direct um, um, contact at the community level. Um, unless others have others uh, have more to add on the community um, uh, facilitator question, I think that was a, a really helpful response from Donna. We have another question specifically around some of the connections um, between reproductive health and climate change in the context of COVID-19, or maybe even more broadly. Um, wondering, a, a question asking whether you could provide an example of any civil society efforts that are working at the intersection of these two during COVID. So I think that's probably for Jenny, but others are, are welcome, Donna, and others to, to chime in. Yeah, um, and and it may be that uh, Donna ha or Yolanda has a, um, uh, more information to share specifically around what's going on with sexual and reproductive rights and, and services during COVID. Um, I can speak uh, to the broader issue. Uh, um, you know, I, I think it's, it, I, I think there, this is a really, both really important and really delicate issue. Um, one of the things that I think is a real challenge is that there are folks in the climate space talking about population <laughs> um, that are not sexual and reproductive health advocates. Um, and they're not, um, they're not versed in the, you know, um, sexual and reproductive health uh, rights approach. Um, and so there's this kind of concern about population population that can be very alienating um, to a number of communities and groups. And, um, and I think, What's vitally important is for those organizations that are working on this issue, that have been working on the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights globally, to be the ones leading that conversation in relationship 
to climate change. And it is really important that we discuss that in relationship to climate change in part because the impacts of climate change um, that bring drought and crop failures or extreme weather events and that sort of thing have an impact on people's ability to manage their lives. And they, they, people need the ability to control their um, sexuality and their reproduction in those contexts. We also know that um, climate change impacts have made uh, young women in particular more vulnerable in some settings because they're having to travel further for water. They're further away from their community or village and they're in unsafe situations and, and are um, subject to sexual predation. Um, so there are those kinds of issues coming up, it, it, kind of those access to services that people need in order to do what they need to do to, to direct their lives. Um, but we really need kind of the sexual and reproductive health rights groups leading the conversation so that it's handled in the appropriate way and really centered on human rights. But as to how that's playing out specifically around COVID-19, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, maybe if I could just chime in a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not too um, versed with um, the climate change aspects, but uh, perhaps uh, what I can say with regards to COVID-19 and sexual reproductive health, particularly for young women, is that uh, what we've seen um, as a result of the lockdown restrictions um, and young women being out of school um, and also uh, a lack of access to uh, pregnancy prevention and also uh, STI and, and HIV prevention uh, services during the strict lockdowns um, really has impacted um, how uh, young women are getting access to, to, to these uh, services and also them being out of school um, has also been a, a huge issue. I mean, in South Africa, it, uh, thank goodness it wasn't for too long, but in other African regions, um, young women were out of school for considerable periods of time. And I know organizations like UNICEF were really championing to actually, you know, have the restrictions uh, reduced so that we could get young girls back in school. So I, I think at the moment we haven't really seen the impact of what this has been. I think we are only going to see the, the true impact in the next uh, coming months of what these um, restrictions have been. And uh, maybe to just highlight also that um, as, as SATAC, what we've been trying to advocate for is uh, making sure that we're strengthening uh, systems and, and not being opportunistic and just uh, focusing on a particular disease and focusing on how, you know, we uh, throw everything, including this kitchen sink towards that particular disease, but really um, strengthening the system. So looking at um, funding mechanisms for health R&D, uh, looking at regulatory systems for, um, for, for, you know, technologies across disease areas so that today it might be COVID, but tomorrow it might be another disease. But if those systems are strengthened and we are institutionalizing good governance and good engagement um, uh, mechanisms and uh, civil society participation policy processes, uh, I think that will set us up in good stead for, uh, for the future. Thanks, Yolanda. And I think um, we're almost out of time, but for those who are interested in some of those um, FPRH climate intersections, there are a number of organizations, including ours, that are working in this sort of population health environment intersection um, that if you do some Googling, you may find. I also wanted to mention there was a request for a link to the survey that I mentioned, um, the work, the global survey that was conducted by the CSEM, as well as the article published in the BMJ uh, that we collaborated on with the Social Participation Technical Network. My colleague Eliana has just posted the link to the BMJ um, article, and in that article, you can link to the survey results on our website, which I hope is uh, helpful. Um, in your uh, in your advocacy. Um, and I can share that again, if that didn't show up for everybody, I'll do that. Um, there's, there's one last uh, question, maybe in our last couple of um, 
minutes here and as we head into wrapping up the panel and and looking forward to celebrating UHC Day, um, there is a recent uh, UHC 2030 State of Universal Health Coverage Commitment Report that really touches on the need for governments to engage civil society based on what I shared at the beginning about the survey in the COVID response, um, but also really urges us to do a little more coordination among civil society. This has already been the discussion um, of the day, sort of how we can work together, but um, there's a particular question here about advocacy at the country level. So as we um, come to the end of our time together, I just wanted to give uh, maybe Donna, Yolanda, Jenny, the chance to sort of make, you know, a, a few sentence <laughs> closing remarks, uh, either about the way that uh, we can all work together on the better coordination at the country level or in the global space where you are. Um, I'll start since in the, our same panelist order, uh, Yolanda. Uh, thank you, Amy. I think we've heard uh, in various platforms, including the, the rich discussions we've had today, how important it is to engage civil society and I've sat in a number of regional meetings where I've had this being said over and over again, how community engagement and civil society engagement is important. But what we're not seeing is, uh, you know, the investments that go along with that. Uh, and quite often, you know, we, we don't have the budgets for community engagement. We don't have the budgets for civil society engagement. And I think it's, it's, it's important that as, as we highlight, you know, the importance of this, we also uh, include that in, in, in funding this work. Um, and also um, just to mention that really um, civil society organizations need to um, coordinate a lot more. Um, and, you know, let's not compete with one another, but collaborate with one another. <laughs> Beautiful. And it's quite Beautiful. difficult, it, it, you know, everybody's competing for funding, but I think really, let's try and uh, collaborate. Yeah. Jenny? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, conversations like this one are a fantastic start. And um, every time I meet with someone or converse with someone from a, a different um, strand of health work, um, my understanding of where the intersections are and, and also what are the important issues where there might not be intersections, but it's really important to elevate and support their work on those issues is increased. So more conversations like this, I think are really important. Um, I, I, I do know that sometimes we get into this mindset that you know, we have to secure the funding for our own issue. We have to secure the attention to our own issue. But I actually think that coming together across the health community, um, particularly um, uh, mobilizing civil society and engaging the civil society organizations, bringing our voices jointly together can be really, really powerful. Um, and I think that can then in turn um, address some of those resource issues, whether attention or money or time, because you know, we can insist upon the resources needed to address our collective issues. Thanks, Jenny. Um, uh, briefly, Donna, some final words. Yeah, I, do, I don't think my two panel member panelists, Yolanda and Jenny, could have said it better. I think it is so important to, that we have to remove the, that, that trust element, that lack of trust that we have amongst our civil society organizations if we are to move forward together. And if we are to move forward um, to create the impact that we know we have to create. And, and, and more and more governments are looking at us in terms of how we can bring our, our energies together and our issues together so that the, the resources can be, can be better utilized across alliances or across groups of, of civil society organizations rather than be working in silos. So that, um, and so that if we have to complement each other's work, if we have to make the intersections that we know must be done across, across all the various um, sectors, then we have to work together to get the impact that we, that we have to achieve. So I think COVID-19 pandemic presents an opportunity for us to love each other more and to come together more in order that we can have the results, the, the, the impact that we want to see 
with regard to the health of the most vulnerable and those persons in grassroots organizations that don't have the resources to do so. So I wanna thank you, Jenny and, and, and Yolanda um, for um, your contributions, because I have learned a lot from you too today. Um, and Amy, I thank you as well. Well, thanks, Donna. That's a great ending. Let's love each other more, move forward uh, together. Thanks to all of you who are here and who've uh, stuck around uh, for the, um, sorry, we went a little bit over time, but it's such a rich conversation. And I wanted us to have an opportunity to hear as much as possible from our panelists and from all of you. I'd like to thank our colleagues at the Global Health Council for making this event possible. There will be a recording on the website shortly. If you'd like to share it with your colleagues, uh, we encourage you to continue to partner uh, with Global Health Con Council as we move forward together. And a big thanks again and virtual round of applause for my, uh, my panelists today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank really you. Really a pleasure. Yes. Bye -bye. Bye. And nice meeting Jenny and Yolanda for the first time. <laughs> nice to meet yeah. you both. Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.